Hello, and welcome to another episode of Outlier Academy's 20-Minute Playbook Series, where each week we sit down with an elite performer from iconic founders to world-renowned investors and best-selling authors to dive into the ideas, frameworks, and strategies that got them to the top of their field, all in less than 20 minutes. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, I sit down with Eric Markowitz, who is the head of research at Worm Capital. Worm is one of my favorite hedge funds, and I've been reading their quarterly reports for years. They run a concentrated long-only strategy and invest in technology, innovation, and disruption. They have a concentrated portfolio of between 5 and 10 positions that today includes Shopify, Spotify, Tesla, Airbnb, Amazon, and NextEra Energy. Since inception, Worm has compounded their investors' capital at over 31% per year, while the S&P 500 over the same period has delivered just over 15%. In this episode, we cover Eric's origins as a journalist and how that shaped his approach to investment research. We talk about Worm's two-step research process, which starts with what they call the Jane Goodall phase and ends with Elon Musk, the engineer. Trust me, these names are weird, but the content is absolutely amazing. We explore why Eric focuses on slowing down the research process as well as the rules and guardrails they use to ensure they get the best research outcomes. And we discuss the behavioral side of investing, how Eric thinks about it, and why it's so powerful in shaping investment results over time. You can find the notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 99. To learn more about Worm Capital, visit wormcapital.com. You can also follow Eric Markowitz on Twitter at Eric Markowitz. That's M-A-R-K-O-W-I-T-Z. With that, let's listen and learn to Eric Markowitz Playbook. Eric Markowitz, thank you so much for joining me back on Outlier Academy. I'm really excited to have you on to dive into the playbook portion. So we're going to talk about how you approach research, um, you know, the behavioral side of investing, a ton of stuff. So thanks for the time. So I want to start off this episode, you know, for anyone that's listening to this, I highly encourage you to go and listen to the Spotlight interview where we talk about uh, Worm Capital, where Eric's a director of research. Um, I'm a huge fan of the firm. We talk about a bunch of how they view the world, the worm worm algorithm, the worm theory, a bunch of worm stuff, uh, which will make sense when you listen to it. In this one, Eric, I wanted to start off first by uh, talking about your background because you have a super fascinating background in that you started your career in journalism and now you're in, you know, a similar but very different world of director of research focused on public equities. How did that happen? <laughs> what was that journey like? You'd be surprised. I mean, there's a bunch of um, ex- ex-journalists working in this business because I think actually the skill set, when you dig a little beneath the surface, um, they're, they're pretty similar. And so just by way of background, yeah, I went to school in New York, went to New York University. I went for both journalism and business. And I always thought I could find some job where I could just get to research lots of different things because I think I... I have a bit of like maybe professional ADD where I just want to like learn stuff and yeah I just I'm just like you know I, I get I get bored of you know having to do the same thing every day and so I always thought of you know business journalism as I was always fascinated with business because I think it's like a reflection of culture and sort of the changing attitudes of societies and I was always interested in money and how money flows through culture and through um, individuals and. I was always fascinated with new technologies. And so my first you know, real reporting job out of college was I wrote about the intersection of business technology and culture. So I lived in New York. I wrote about technology companies. I wrote about like the people at technology companies. I wrote about what they were doing, how it was you know, potentially going to change the world. Um, so I wrote you know, articles about self-driving vehicles, drones, um, you know, lots of different sort of tech gadgets. Uh, I spent some time living in San Francisco and writing a lot about Silicon Valley-based companies. I got to know a bunch of investors and entrepreneurs. I was writing for a magazine called Inc. My last story there, just you know, sort of to contextualize what I was doing, was uh, the big feature cover story on Aaron Levy at Box, which is now a public company. I wrote about them when he was you know, still private and he was kind of building out a big mobile part of their business. So I was always just fascinated in sort of this idea of, well, you know, we're living through kind of a unique period in time. I grew up before the internet, but like kind of during the internet. And I got to see how it was just fundamentally changing the world for both good and bad. I remember, you know, partially when I first, you know, went to college, I remember being so excited because that would enable me to get a Facebook account back when Facebook, you still had to have a college. Uh, You know, it was so fascinating to me to be able to spend the first part of my career kind of on the ground level, a lot of these businesses, these like, you know, big, 
technology businesses, I always kind of knew that journalism to me was like this this great opportunity to spend my 20s just going out traveling the world, writing about cool companies. Like one of my favorite stories, like before I left journalism was I went to Paris to go write about Taser. Uh, I'm actually a huge fan of them. <laughs> That's cool. That's a... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I profiled uh, Rick Smith, um, the, the founder and CEO of, of Axon, which you know created the Taser product. And so that was sort of like my idea of I, if I can go and just like spend time researching companies, um, that would be amazing. And I, you know, I, I kind of had developed a sense that okay, this would be really cool to do as an investor, you know, because um, as as maybe some of your audience knows, journalism is a is it's a tough industry to you know start building wealth for for your family. And so I was getting married and um, you know wanting to build a family and thought, okay, I'm going to take all these skills as that I've developed as like a journalist of asking the right questions, figuring out the story, sort of digging into something, maybe getting a little bit like obsessed with a subject, um, which is another soft skill that I think is like definitely really applicable. And it was really just sort of like fate or kismet. I don't know what exactly, but I got an email from my now colleague, Dan Crowley. And he basically said, you know, our founder, Arnie Allison, likes your writing about technology businesses. We're looking, you know, to potentially build out our research team. What do you say? And I just thought, sure, you know, it's an interesting meeting. Figured nothing would come of it, but why not? You know, I was living in Los Angeles at the at the time and I think I remember talking to my girlfriend then, who's now my wife. She says, Yeah, just go take the meeting, you know? Uh, <laughs> so I, I met with Arnie. I quickly realized, like, oh, this is the smartest guy I've ever met. He's like fascinating and he's kind of like doing exactly what I want to be doing, which is like investing in these cool technology businesses that are like fundamentally changing the world around us. That's a bit of a longer answer, but um, really how I got to where I am today, which is spending the first, you know, eight, 10 years reporting, just interviewing like thousands of, you know, entrepreneurs, executives, uh, investors, trying to understand like what technologies, what companies were going to be sort of potentially the next, you know, big thing. I, you know, certainly at Inc, I was writing about companies like Etsy and, um, you know, like Kickstarter. I just, you know, that was how I was just spending my time. And now I'm kind of doing the same thing. I'm just, allocating capital and and helping sort of um, synthesize information so that we can make really good decisions. But ultimately, it just comes from a very similar process of, you know, asking questions and, you know, just spending my time kind of geeking out and reading all the stuff that comes out and talking to people and interviewing people. Yeah. No, I love, I mean, even obviously hearing you talk through that, I'm like, yes, it's basically the same thing. You're just, it's just the focus of your research is, you know, slightly more narrow, I guess, maybe in some ways. Were you growing up, did you dabble in investing? When did you get interested in, I, I feel like, and maybe you haven't had this experience, but I feel like there's being interested in business and then there's being interested in investing. And I feel like they're mostly tangential and there's a little bit of an overlap, but it's not that much. What was your kind of avenue into investing and your curiosity there? Yeah, I think I remember in in high school there was like a, a student competition, and it was like a, a stock market competition. And you were given you know fake dollars, and I just remember thinking I did it. And I think I'm I'm not going to claim that I won. I, I remember winning, but who knows how memory works. Um, I just remember being really excited by it, like be, by being really excited by this idea that I could go and through the fruits of my research and my like nerdy obsessions of just spending time on things, potentially be able to reap great rewards from it. And I, I didn't know anything about value investing. You know, it took me much, much later in life to really discover a lot of sort of like the the core readings that I think are necessary to to really work in this business. But I think it was you know, to me, what what attracted me to it, I was never like a sports guy. I mean, I played, but I wasn't very good. I was more of like a games guy. You know, I, I loved games. I loved, you know, games of strategy. I loved poker in high school. I mean, I was just like obsessed with poker. And I think I saw, you know, a lot of similarities to investing, which was, you know, you're playing against other people. You know, if you make a few good decisions, you, your, your, your rewards can be really great. Um, but it's it's a game where you don't have all the information, and so you just have to make good calculated bets. Um, and I think that's kind of like initially what got me interested. So I want to talk about um, Worm's two-step research process, and uh, partially because you know as we were kind of brainstorming um, what we might cover, 
you, uh, you know, kind of launched into, here's a little bit of our research process. And I just thought it was absolutely fascinating. And I think, you know, one, just the way you were able to articulate it in terms of what you're doing at various different stages, but also just the fact that it's not hard. Um, but, you know, I think you have a unique approach. Can you talk about those two steps? And I won't give away what they are, but kind of the two steps in that process and, and how you think about that. <laughs> We can talk about those two steps, and this all comes from Arnie Allison, our founder and CEO. His, um, his, his mind is way more interesting than mine. But the number one step of research is what he calls the uh, the Jane Goodall approach, which is you plant yourself on the hillside and you just watch the chimpanzees, and you don't have an opinion, and you just watch them. You take notes. You see how they interact with each other. And that's like our sort of metaphor for how we approach researching industries and companies, which is we take our time, we have no opinions, and we just start watching them and seeing how they interact with the world around them. I think that the one thing that I've personally learned the most over the last, you know, let's say decade of doing this now is like just this idea that it's so important to while there's a big difference between like conviction and, and opinions, um, conviction is great. Opinions are really bad because opinions will really screw you up. What's really important about this first step is just gathering the raw data, just just saying, okay, well, this company is doing this. This is how, you know, uh, this other company is doing it. This is how many customers they have. This is, and you just start sketching out, you know, quite literally all the different companies in a specific industry that you're interested in. The next part of the research process is the engineering phase. That's what we call like the engineering phase where, where we start like taking it apart and seeing actually how all these things work. So we just want to understand like the inputs and outputs of a business, really this idea of value proposition of like customers are exchanging capital for a product or service. What exactly is the product or service? How is it made? Where does it come from? And so this is like really like the technical analysis that we really spend a lot of time on, which is once we've sort of identified the the dynamics of an industry, we just go, you know, just spend as much time as possible to understand literally how the products are made or the services. And so if we're looking at, let's say, just to use a big example like Amazon, how does the seller system work? Like how does the actual platform dynamics work? Who makes money? What percentage? Like exactly how it works. We don't you know, we don't care as much about like the high level profits, like how much Amazon is extraction, you know, at, at the end of every quarter, we want to understand like the value proposition for the sellers on the platform for really like the, the nitty gritty of it. So that's sort of like our, our overall framework, which is we call the two step. It's the, the Jane Goodall, and then sort of the, you know, the, the engineering phase, the Elon Musk, the engineering phase, take it apart and put it back together again. I love that second part, because I feel like it one, it recognizes that, this quote shows up in a lot of books, but, you know, uh, a way that a lot of entrepreneurs think about building a business is that they're building the machine, you know, and I know, I know Elon obviously talks about this a lot. This is a concept as well in, in Ray Dalio's principles of kind of, you have to be working on the machine all the time. You have to be kind of looking down on it from above. And anyway, so I, I love this idea of number one, it's almost like first you're just observing. And part of that is so you don't have opinions. And so you're starting from a blank slate and you're just taking it in. And then part two is really about deconstructing. And I think understanding how the systems and machines work and yeah are looking at inputs and outputs and okay something happens here what what shows up on the other side of the machine it seems really interesting and you talked about that a big part of doing this was just slowing down the research process why is that so important and i guess what is bad about a about a fast research process or where you're kind of i don't know speed running it <laughs> yeah i mean we're just kind of like um you know humans are really just big hunks of flesh with some software attached, right? And I think our operating system is is maybe not as great as we give it credit for. And so our brains are like, you know, uh, a, a Google Chrome tab, like with, with like 50 tabs open, right? And, and so like the system starts to slow down itself if you have too much things going on, right? So I guess the way I think about research is like close out all the tabs, exit out of all the programs that are taking up bandwidth and just focus on one thing at a time. Just open up like one application. Often that involves like just like printing out stuff or like listening to a podcast and going for a walk. And so I think that like it's in my own experience, it's just been integral to really deconstruct and slow down reading a transcript, even like an earnings transcript and just like reading it a couple of times, highlighting it, going through it. Because I think our culture and sort of like our the environment that we 
we're in right now is is kind of obsessed with like multitasking and 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 doing a lot of things at once. And so that's often like antithetical to really good research. Like if you think about like even like Jane Goodall or any sort anyone who's like been a great researcher or sociologist, like they, they just spend a lot of time doing one thing for a period of years. Um, and then only do they really make great have in, have great insights from it. Um, so so I think that's part of it is just this recognition that our brains are limited and we have to optimize for what we're given, you know, what we're born with. And uh, we're not supercomputers. We can't, you know, take in lots of data and compute it really quickly. Well, that makes me feel better about my own capabilities. So if anything else, <laughs> it sounds like we might. Yeah, I think my brain is sounds a lot like that browser with 50 tabs open. I, I This, you know, there may not be anything new here because you just talked a little bit about why slowing down the process is so important and you know yeah what that enables but one of the questions i want to ask is so you've now been doing this for a number of years and i would assume you've obviously gotten better or you've had some ahas or you've had some insights in terms of okay what does good quality research look like feel like you know um and so one of the questions i want to ask is just one are there any big lessons you've learned or ahas? And then maybe, and you know, that's kind of on the positive side. And then on the flip side, are there any rules or guardrails that you have or anything that, I don't know, when something's happening, you kind of, your spidey senses go up and you say, okay, I don't do this. Or <laughs> this is not something to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I suppose like on the aha side of just like, uh, I think for me, it's a recognition of, um, how long it really takes to understand something. And even when you think you understand it, um, you probably need to spend more more time with it. I think that like, you know, just to borrow from some experience that I had as, as a journalist, I think that, you know, you could read a story and you could say, wow, like that, that, that reporter seems to know, like, it seems like they know a lot about this subject. But if you really enmesh yourself in something for so long where you become so kind of obsessed with it and you know every you think you know every in and out of something you can read that same story by that same reporter and realize oh actually they're full of shit and so i think what i've kind of realized is just like the companies that we're focused on it takes a lot of time to really know if what you're reading in the news or some analysis of it has credibility because i think that's ultimately what we're trying to do day to day is determine which pieces of input have credibility to our process and synthesizing that and curating it so that we let in the correct information and and keep out the bad information, uh, the false information. So I think that's sort of the aha is just, you know, maybe it's not a, a, the sexiest answer, but just like it takes a long time to really develop an expertise in something and feel confidence in it. And I'm certainly, you know, not there yet on a lot of areas that we study. I, you know, it's sort of like an active process. I'd say like on the challenging, like, you know, sort of avoid it side is we've talked about this before, you know, of this idea of like action bias of, of feeling like just because you now know something, you've spent time researching something that, wow, I have to, I have to do something. Um, and that could be defensive. It could be like, oh, I'm scared now because my thesis on something has changed and we should get rid of it. Or it's be like, wow, this thing is so great. We should invest in it. And I think the lesson learned is, you know, uh, there's so much value to patience in this business that just slowing down not only the research process but the actual like allocation process and the trading process is immensely valuable. Um, and I think some of the greatest investors just do nothing, right? Like that is such a hard thing to conceptualize, um, especially in our culture that values action and values doing things. But I think it's something that you know I've I've, I've learned over time, or at least attempting to learn that like. Sometimes really the best answer is just do nothing. Yeah. It it's almost sounds like another way to maybe express that idea is if you just slow down the process, you immediately cross off a bunch of issues and risks and behavioral biases and things that are just not helpful. <laughs> and so just by reducing the speed, you're setting yourself up for success. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you probably are as well, but like just interested in like, you know, behavioral psychology, behavioral economists, like I think that's some of the most, you know, valuable investing um, ideas are, you know, contained in books written by guys like, you know, Daniel Kahneman, that kind of, you know, genre. There's definitely like an element of like, you know, the the quantitative um, as being super important, but I think um, the behavioral elements to this business are bigger than everything. Totally. They're, well, they're, 
they play a massive role and they're also invisible. And so it's very easy to underweight them or, you know, not, not recognize them or not see them or, you know, not appreciate them. Yeah. I, I want to talk about that a little bit, which is, you know, one of the things that I know you and I have discussed before is just some of the behavioral advantages that you think you guys have at Worm just with your approach. And so, I, you know, we can focus on the Worm aspect of it or we can just bubble it up super high level. But I wanted to just get your thoughts on what are the behavioral advantages and, and how have you focused on kind of cultivating those? And that could be at Worm, that could just be in your research and your work. You know, I think everyone has their own way of doing it. I'll just speak to how we do it, not necessarily that it's better or worse, um, but how we've even set up our organization to enable us to work in a way that's most comfortable to us. So we don't have like a big fancy office. Um, I work from home. Arnie Alson, our, our founder and CEO, he works from home. Um, and it's very much an intentional choice. I mean, that was we did this before the the pandemic and everyone was remote. But I mean, so much about, I think, making good decisions is giving yourself the the space and the time necessary to and the comfort to do so. And I think that even like the interpersonal dynamics of being in an office can can yield potentially good good outcomes. But I think in our business, a lot of it is just like it's soloed work that is then shared via, you know, uh, a Zoom call or just a phone call, um, regular check-ins just to talk through things. And it's a process that, you know, has worked for us. Um, I think that if you're in an office and, and potentially behaviorally, there's like an impulse to have more action, like, you know, hey, let's pitch this idea. Let's get this new idea in the portfolio or like, and that's just not how we wanted to optimize. We wanted to optimize for, well, you know, Arnie is our CIO and I'm director of research. How, how best can we work together to put together the optimal portfolio and together with our partners um, at the firm? Like, this is just how we've chosen to do it. I think also just how we spend our time, you know, what we read is is really important. Like if you if you read sort of news constantly, you're going to just going to go crazy because it's just all negative. It's all, you know, it's going to force you into making bad decisions. And so going back to, you know, books that we've read in the past that have been just sort of like great guidelines of how to think and how to invest. Um, there's a book I keep on my desk. I'm looking at it right now. It's 101 Years on Wall Street. I already recommended this book to me a while back. And it's just like, it's an investor's almanac, just most boring book ever. But it just shows you that like, you know, in 19, you know, 22, there was like some great concern that everyone was freaking out about and that's over. You know, things like the, the market is just a series of cycles and everything passes. And, and so sometimes it's just good to sort of ground yourself in that. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, there's just a couple of things, but I think that like, just, just really thinking through, like, what are you trying to achieve and physically setting yourself up so that you can put together sort of like the, the most optimal solution for it. Seems like a, a, theor, a clear through line for a lot of worms culture is just kind of, you know, deliberately slowing down the process, being deliberate about how you're spending, spending your time, being thoughtful. It, you know, we talked earlier about uh, that, you know, your your office isn't anything like billions. It's almost like instead it's like a, a monastery <laughs> or some sort of a Zen, you know, Japanese structure. <laughs> yeah, it's a bunker. Uh, <laughs> it's like it's just, you know, books and crazy notes on whiteboards and, uh, you know, stacks of paper. And if you have a great office, like that's awesome. You know, I have not, I have no no ill will towards anyone who has that. Um, I just, you know, for us, and it's just not, it's not pertinent exactly what we do. I'm a huge believer in, you know, every, it's a single player game. You have to figure out what works for you. <laughs> You're not going to learn that necessarily by observing what other people are doing. Okay. I want to ask a few kind of closing questions. And one is, and I'm sure you'll have a, a fascinating answer to this, not to, you know, add any more pressure, but one of my favorite questions to ask is just, about a recent fascination. So something you've been researching, reading recently that you just can't get out of your mind. What is that at the moment? <laughs> or what has that been recently? <laughs> yeah, we're obsessed with this idea of like, what does the future look like? And for me, it's like right now, I'm like bots, like robots. Um, there's some companies pursuing this um, through a variety of modalities. But robotics, you know, in 2030, like what could that look like? And so it's very like science fiction-y, but I think we're actually nearing a point where some of the, the neural net architecture that is necessary to have like really generalized AI and sentient AI um, is becoming 
more likely, at least in the next few years. So I'm I'm very nerdily geeking out on on the potential for that, and then also who which company is 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 best poised to succeed because what's the overall market for what's the TAM of the labor market? It's pretty big, you know. Like so, you know, just like questions around that is kind of a current fascination. Yeah, I mean, it's been a fascination of mine. A company I looked at recently is Gecko Robotics, and it's a private company. It's around robotics, but what it does is is both super niche, but also I think just kind of fascinating. Um, and this is one of the things I love about businesses. You know, to what we've talked about, it's just kind of like a window of curiosity, and one thing leads to another, leads to another. But with Gecko Robotics, basically the idea is, you know, uh, for anyone living in a city or not in a city. You know, here in Colorado near Denver, there's just massive industrial bases. And so there's, you see all these different plants, manufacturing plants, some of them are refining facilities, you know, but it's, it's the big industrial facilities. Those need to be inspected. They need to be inspected for a bunch of reasons. It could be a grain silo. It can be a water holder. It can be a, you know, some sort of a coolant or an exhaust valve. They all have to be ex- um, inspected. They're not particularly hospitable. Like the temperatures can reach hundreds of degrees, up to 300 degrees. You know, you have to scale these things. It's not like they're easy to climb around and say, oh, get Gecko Robotics is like these tiny little robots that literally have almost like gecko feet so they can stick to almost anything, but they basically will just crawl and loop around and be able to survey these structures in a way that, you know, no human would be able to. And, you know, the the technology is both really advanced and also really basic in a lot of ways. And I feel like that's kind of robotics today is, you know, both really advanced in terms of capabilities, but really basics in in terms of, I don't know where it's at in its developmental cycle, but it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Okay, I want to ask as well, you talked about 101 years on Wall Street. What other books have you loved? And these can be, you know, weird, esoteric ones, old ones, just, you know, if you had a, if you had to list a few of your top books that would live with 101 years on Wall Street, what would they be? I mean, I'm a sucker for the George Soros book, The Alchemy of Finance. Um, you know, Soros, I find to be like just a fascinating guy because I think I mean he started his career really as like a failed philosopher, um, and I I love I love people maybe you know for myself like start start in one direction end up going in a different direction, um, so so that's one. And then you know just a non finance book that um, I really love is it's a collection of stories by a guy named Joseph Mitchell called Up in the Old Hotel, and uh, he, he was a writer for the New Yorker in like the 30s and 40s, and he did these really colorful vignettes of just people. Um, who lived in New York City in that time period. And it has no real, you know, investing advice, but I just think it's like, I'm always fascinated in like culture and how, you know, cultures evolve and how ultimately business is a reflection of changing cultures. And to me, I think there's like just some interesting insights in there about individuals and how they existed then and their desires and um, how some of those things have changed and not changed, but ultimately history just kind of repeats over time. Um, And and so I, I found some cool like insights from that book. Yeah, it's funny. It sounds like up in the old hotel and 101 years on Wall Street are kind of very similar. <laughs> At the end of the days, they just are focused on different spheres. Well, thank you so much again for the time. It's been you know amazing to have you on. And just really quickly, for anyone that wants to follow Worm Capital and Eric's writing, he publishes an amazing newsletter called Nightcrawler um, that everyone should subscribe to. And people can go and learn more about Worm Capital at wormcapital.com. And they can also follow you on Twitter at Eric Markowitz. Um, and we'll link, I mean, you talked about a bunch of amazing things, including a few great books. We'll link to all that in the show notes at outlieracademy.com. Thank you so much for the time, Eric. It's been awesome. Cool. No, thank you, Daniel. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. You can find links to everything we discussed as well as the notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 99. It's 99. For more from Eric Markowitz, listen to episode 96, where he joins me on our Investor Spotlight series to go deep on Worm Capital's approach to investing including how they've compounded their capital at over 31% per year over the last decade, compared to just 15% for the S&P 500. And we dive into what they call worm algorithm and worm theory of investing. You can also find more incredible interviews with the founders of Level, Superhuman, Eight Sleep, Rally, and Common Stock, as well as best-selling authors and the world's smartest investors, all at outlieracademy.com. You can now also find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash outlieracademy. On our channel, you'll find all of our full-length interviews as well as our favorite short clips from every episode, including this one. So make sure to subscribe now. Thank you for listening. We'll see you right here next week on Outlier Academy.